Led Zeppelin, The Who, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, Malice, Juggernauts of Rock and Roll, Smelters of Metal. These are a few of the bands that have climbed the ranks of stardom to become worldwide sensations, but none have defined metal culture, and every culture for that matter, quite as brilliantly and loudly as England's legendary Spinal Tap. Fronted by Nigel Tufnell, David St. Hubbins, and Derek Smalls, their energy, power, and phraseology define them as one of the most influential bands of all time. Those familiar with the group are probably already aware of their turbulent history, their rotating door of musicians, the controversial subject matter of their lyrics, and of course, their disastrous 1982 North American tour, chronicled in Marty DeBerge's renowned rockumentary, This is Spinal Tap. Though the band has been vocal with their distaste of the film over the years, the documentary is a cherished artifact of a true turning point in the band's history, providing a rare glimpse of life on the road as working musicians, through all the highs and the lows, and the really lows. DeBerge's documentary is still one of the seminal rock and roll pictures of all time, but what if I were to tell you there was an alternate version out there, one going deeper into the lives of its subject matter, chronicling more behind-the-scenes antics, more music, more philosophy, more cock bulges? I'm referring to the mythic workprint version of the film, which clocks in at a staggering four and a half hours long, three hours longer than the theatrically released film. This is the holy grail that tap fans have sought since the movie's release, and in this episode of Rough Cuts, I'm giving you all the nitty-gritty details. But hey, enough of my yakking. What do you say? Let's boogie. Welcome, friends. Denny here with an artery-clogging dose of heavy-duty rock and roll. Now, if you'll allow me to break the fourth wall at this point, I'd like to step outside the cinematic universe of Spinal Tap to conduct this discussion of the film. It's now well established that Spinal Tap is a fictitious band conceived by its principal members, that's Christopher Guest, Michael McKean, and Harry Shearer, as well as the film's director, Rob Reiner. That doesn't change the fact that this band and this film have become cult icons with their special brand of schlock rock. It's generally considered one of the greatest comedies of all time, begging the question, is the longer work print version beaming with all that comedic gold that the theatrical film is famous for? Or was there good reason to leave it all behind on the cutting room floor? I wanted to capture the, the sights, the sounds, the smells of a hard-working rock band on the road. And I got that. But I got more. A lot more. Rob Reiner plays filmmaker Marty DeBerge, a commercial director with a mission to make a film that takes a hard, honest look at the life of his favorite band, Spinal Tap, currently on their comeback, Farewell Tour. Through interviews and candid on-the-road footage, we learn of the history of the band and their current reputation, quickly realizing that their glory days are trailing further and further behind them. Their new album is being banned because of its cover art, fewer and fewer people are showing up to their performances, and their shows are plagued with technical difficulties of biblical proportions. Their manager, Ian, tries to keep them afloat and naive to their true situation, but the reality sets in as they struggle to stay relevant in the evolving world of music. On top of this, internal tensions within the band are flaring as founding members and lifelong friends, David and Nigel, have their relationship put to the test as David's girlfriend, Janine, joins them on the road and tries to take them in new creative directions, much to Nigel's distaste. The film is aesthetically presented as a real documentary. Never at any time did the actors wink at the camera or break character. And this is probably why many people unfamiliar with the film think it's a real life documentary and mock the band's snobbish behavior. Look, who's in here? No one. And then in here, there's a little guy. Look, yeah. so it's, it's a complete catastrophe. No, you're right. The funny thing is many musicians have testified that it's as close to the real thing as anybody's ever captured on film. Famous stories from the road from bands like Uriah Heep, Black Sabbath, uh, The Trogs. They serve as primary inspirations for many of the scenes, making tap an embodiment of all the things that can and will go wrong. That's a movie that I watched. I didn't laugh, I wept. It was so close to the truth. Working on a sex farm. In my eyes, what makes This Is Spinal Tap such a unique and fresh film to this day is how much it commits to its documentary format. Reiner directed the film without a script. 
Basically, scenes were discussed in advance, character arcs were worked out from beginning to end, and individual biographies were memorized by each of the actors, so no conflicting information was said during scenes. But beyond that, the content is determined completely by the actors and the camera's ability to follow the action. This is not a cleanly produced movie. It's very gritty, noticeably cheap, but this only adds to its authenticity. It also helps to have three of the most brilliant improvisational actors working alongside of each other. McKean, Guest, and Shearer are so convincing in these roles that I honestly forget they aren't really British. It really puts perspective on things, doesn't it? Not yeah. too much. There's too yeah, much fucking perspective now. They aren't just trying to pile jokes into a scene. The funniest moments in the film are just moments that are observed from a character's behavior. You're on ten on your guitar. Where can you go from there? Where? I don't know. Nowhere, exactly. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. Neither do the characters directly parody people like Ozzy Osbourne or Jeff Beck. They have palpable and distinguishable personalities, allowing the film to take surprising and effective dramatic turns with Nigel and David's relationship. Janine's introduction invites comparisons to a Yoko Ono Beatles situation, a woman intruding and disrupting a boy's fantasy world. I've heard interpretations that Nigel's hatred of Janine is actually jealousy, as he is romantically in love with David. I think that's a feasible angle to take, but I think that Nigel is more like a little brother and David the older one. How old are you guys? Take him anyway. How old you guys? Nigel doesn't understand why David wastes his time with adult commitments. Janine disrupts their adolescent fantasy and comes between their friendship. Nigel pouts and sulks like a kid when she's around or even just mentioned. And when she has a stronger influence on the direction of the band, the tension just kind of boils over. You can't fucking concentrate because you're fucking wife. Simple as that, all right? It's your fucking wife. She's not my wife. Well, whatever the fuck she is, all right? You can't concentrate. What's even more impressive is that the actors aren't just rock and roll wannabes. They actually wrote and performed all of the music seen in the film for real. In fact, they subsequently released albums and performed together as Spinal Tap to this day. They also perform as their folk music counterparts, the Folksmen, for Christopher Guest's own mockumentary, A Mighty Wind, also worth checking out. When they sit down and talk about their history and reminisce about the good old days, they feel like people who have known each other all of their lives. All of the archival footage of TAP is replicated to a T from what you'd see in real music documentaries and television archives. There's not a frame of this movie that feels inauthentic. It is impeccably observed satire of rock stars facing middle age and losing relevancy, poking fun at vanity, but balancing it with a sincere sense of humanity. Beyond this, I can only start listing moments I love, the catering mimes, the Frank Sinatra obsessed limo driver, getting lost backstage, kicking Artie Fufkin's ass, the delicate piano ballad Lick My Love Pump, do I need to quote the 11th scene? Every sequence is a little comedic masterpiece that works every time you see it. When I first heard of the work print version, I immediately got to work trying to figure out how I could see it. Spinal Tap is one of the funniest movies I've ever seen, and to me a longer version just meant there was just more moments to cherish. More music, more characters, more history of the band. I was beyond excited when I finally tracked down a copy. But in the back of my mind the thought persisted. Maybe there was a reason so much footage was cut. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the history of the group. I understand, Nigel, you and David originally started the band uh, back in, when was it, 1964? Back in 1979, on a TV show titled, uh, the TV show, Spinal Tap made their first appearance. Michael McKean, Christopher Guest, and Harry Shearer did a skit, parodying the over-the-top stage antics of heavy metal groups, playing a song called Rock and Roll Nightmare, which the band would officially record in 2009 on their Back From The Dead album. The skit was pretty basic, but the actors seemed to really see the potential in what they could do with these characters. Rob Reiner was on the show too, playing Wolfman Jack nonetheless, and the group started talking about making a feature film. Reiner took the idea of an improvised movie featuring a fictitious band to various studios for funding and essentially got blank stares wondering what the hell he was talking about. You have to understand, the found footage genre, or the concept of a fake documentary, didn't really exist in the mainstream before this movie. There were examples like Eric Idle's The Ruddles and Albert Brooks' Real Life, but the improvised nature of Reiner's film made it a different beast from even those films. This was a new and original idea, 
so naturally, studios were afraid to take a chance on it. Not to mention that this was Reiner's debut as a feature film director. He really only had Meathead to his name, and not much clout to get this project off the ground on his reputation alone. Please, do me a favor. Help me out. I'm trying to establish myself as a filmmaker. I don't want to have to go crawling back to television. So to give people a better idea of what kind of movie they were envisioning, they decided to produce a 20-minute demo film that essentially cut together highlights of their soft-scripted ideas. Many of the film's most memorable scenes appear in this demo version in a rough form. Uh, this part of it's called the Lick My Love Pump. This isn't what you were commissioned to do. What you were commissioned to do is about 102 times bigger than this. You, you know what the title of that book should really be? It should be, yes I can, if Frank Sinatra says it's okay. <laughs> yeah, could you take that to, um, out and set it, set it right, right here on the... Uh... I mean, uh, he exploded on stage. It was quite bizarre. He exploded, and all that was left was a little stain on his drum seat. After producing the demo, Reiner again made his rounds to studios, who again gave him blank stares and wondered what the hell he was talking about. However, the demo was enough to raise a small budget for the film, and with an experienced documentary crew helmed by producer Karen Murphy, the film was off and shooting. Now, like I said, this is a film that was really the first of its kind, so the cast had a pretty good idea of what it was going to be, but you could still tell they were experimenting with the actual form of what the end result was going to look like. They shot about six hours worth of scenes of the band on tour, and shot an additional four hours of just interviews with the band, making a total of about ten hours that Reiner and editors Kent Beta and Kim Seacrest had to work with. This is how this work print version came to be. It's a narrowed down version of this epic of a comedy. The linear plotline of the film is pretty much the same, however countless deleted scenes, subplots, extended scenes, alternate takes, they're all thrown in this version, showing that they were indeed trying to figure out what material worked, what was necessary to keep for the plot, what was essential in telling the story, what gags garnered the biggest laughs, etc. Just a quick disclaimer though, this workprint version is sourced from a very old, very low quality VHS, so the quality is a... Uh, let's just say it could use some remastering in doubly digital. But thankfully a good portion of deleted scenes were released on DVD in higher quality, so those will be used in place of the bootleg footage when possible. In some ways, the work print feels even more authentic as a rock and roll documentary because there's more sequences of characters killing time, hanging out while they're not playing music, playing games, doing drugs, hitting on women, that kind of thing. It kind of feels like watching that band Rolling Stones documentary, Cocksucker Blues, where roadies were just going around filming during downtime on tour, showing what life was like behind the scenes. Also, because of the atrocious quality of the VHS ripped bootleg, it feels even more like this was leaked out by a member of the road crew or something. It still has the tales of the film reels attached, the musical performances aren't completely in sync yet, and additional lines have yet to be changed in post-production. This wrinkled old person here tells me that you just have God not got me, my sir. reservations. This twisted old fruit here tells me that you just have God not got me, my sir. reservations. That's right, that's right. Straight rock and roll! Rock and roll! There we go! Hello, DC! Hello, DC! Straight rock and roll! Rock and roll! There we go! Hello, Cleveland! Hello, Cleveland! I think one of the biggest differences worth noting is that it features none of the formal interviews seen in the finished film. We learn none of the band's history, and get none of the personal reflections that characters share with Marty. This was either because the interviews weren't shot yet, or because they weren't focusing on incorporating them into the film quite yet. Also absent is DeBerge's intro at the start of the film. It's all just the band on the road and the subsequent misadventures. I can now see that those interviews act as glue to bridge scenes together and help to condense things down, whereas in the work print you see every logical step made from point A, B to C. For example, that scene where they hear Cups and Cakes come on the radio and subsequently their name on the Where Are They Now file? In the theatrical cut, while in a state of depression, they go to visit Elvis's grave, seeking some perspective. The work print version shows Ian coming into the hotel and being puzzled by their lifelessness. Come on, what is this? You bunch of cream pots, you call yourselves rock and rollers? To lift their spirits, 
he begins trashing the hotel room, inviting them to join in. But this is what you should be doing. You know? Come on! Derek! Yeah, Derek. Take this, okay? And do... Dudley! This footage may look familiar because pieces of it were used in the finished film during a montage of Ian gushing about his cricket bat. Having a good solid piece of wood in your hand is quite often useful. After Ian obliterates the place, the band is even more depressed than before. I was really looking forward to watching that nature show. I can't do that now. It's then that we see them make the decision to leave the hotel and go visit Elvis and Graceland. Furthermore, their car ride up to the gates is shown as well and their confusion of how to even enter the place. Diet Keeper! Mrs. Presley! Doing a hard cut to Elvis's tombstone cut out about 10 minutes of footage, and I think it works better to reflect the current mood of the band visually. Some scenes provide additional context to things that previously had little explanation. Remember the party scene where David and Nigel had those cold sores on their lips? Ever wonder how they got those? Turns out, it was from the lead singer of their support group that was carrying an STD. What do you got there? Oh, it's just a sore I get him once a year. Oh. It was actually set up to be a recurring joke in the movie. Every few scenes, one of the band members would now have the herpes sore, implying that one by one they'd been sleeping with the singer and catching the disease. Derek's out of circulation, isn't he? It's interesting that you never actually see the singer in the finished film. They boot the opening act as soon as they all contract the STD. All except Mick, the drummer, who fights to keep them on the road, probably by no coincidence that he was the only one without the sore. The theatrical cut has an overarching theme of the band clinging to childhood fantasies. The very notion of near 40 year olds playing heavy metal implies there is some desire to hang on to youth. All of the band members have this quality, but here, Nigel in particular, is a full blown man child. Oh no, here comes a monster now. You don't hurt Gumby! He's easily distracted, always ready to play instead of work. Or maybe for them, work is play. I'm David St. Hubbard's of Spinal Tap. <laughs> Alright, wait, wait, give me this. Wait a minute, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm not. Put the shoe down a minute. He's playing Jaws. The excursion also plays more to the brother dynamic that I mentioned earlier. David has more of those adult responsibilities he struggles to deal with that begin to isolate him from the group. We actually get to meet David's estranged son, he has a new wave haircut and clothing which David feels ashamed of. He simultaneously wants to be close to his son, but simply can't accept the fact that he's not a reflection of himself. He's rather a symbol of the changing times and how far out of touch he is. Last time I saw you, I had shoulder length blonde hair. You look yeah, great. You look like a fucking angel. Well, no, I, I'm not saying you got to look like uh, an angel or anything else, but I mean, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. The arguments surrounding Janine are much more venomous and hostile. It's fucking Janine! That is it! It's fucking Janine! She's painted as much more of a villain in this version of the movie, determined to assume control of every aspect of the band. Don't give me a hard time. I've been up all night making phone calls, working about this gig. And you're trying to give me a hard time. For why? I'm no, not even playing there. The I don't give a fuck don't if you play the there. Of course she becomes manager, but in one scene she actually makes the decision to replace Nigel with a new guitar player after his quitting the band. A kind of Peter Frampton guitar virtuoso type. Naturally, it doesn't mesh very well. Janine even causes conflicts with Marty DeBerge, trying to halt production to assure she will have final cut over the film. Uh, you have to trust me on this. You just have to trust me because I, I, well, I, I can't be, I can't be hamstrung this way. No, I really can't be hamstrung this way. I didn't find you in the first place. David, in turn, is much more defensive when people call out Janine's behavior. You oh don't God. like the idea because Janine does not fulfill your idea of a rock and roll woman, which is some twat strolling backstage waiting for you with a reading a paperback and uh, waiting for you to come off with a towel. No, that's right? your idea, David. That's your idea. But even he starts to lose patience with her constant interfering. You yeah, come in, you, you get the arse end of the, the conversation, you come out like you're a fucking expert in what we've been talking about. You don't even fucking know. No. There's a great deal more arguing and ugliness the band has to overcome. They are absolutely at each other's throats when trying to record their new single, screaming so much that it's hard to distinguish what is even being said. Thank you very much for taking my son once in your fucking life! Shut, shut up. Oh. In contrast, there are some really nice tranquil moments amongst the arguments, where we see Nigel and David trying to figure out a way to make their friendship last through these rough patches. Derek, as usual, is the lukewarm water of the band. 
He stays observant and calm through most of the situations, however we see some new sides of the character that are somewhat unexpected. He has an entire deleted subplot where he is dealing with an ugly divorce, to put it mildly. No, she's not getting the Lamborghini, Simon! It's not against the law. I mean, you can't just buy a full-page advert in the music papers and publish your divorce demands. No, she's not getting the Earth Station, either! What do you mean I paid for it? Yeah. Yeah, she can have that. Join a cow. Fuck. I mean, can't we just have her killed? You know people. His stress gradually wears on him through the film, which also explodes in the recording session scene. We are paying approximately, as I understand it, 300 quid an hour of our own fucking money to be in here. We're not doing it to indulge childhood fantasies, am I correct? The band turmoil is just relentless. Even the supposed highlights of the tour are deflated by certain reveals. We made the guarantee, come on, that's and, pretty good. And we didn't make any more than that. They were let in for free, is the point. Well, who's that? Well, it's the promoters. Uh, so when they leave, this is good. When they leave, we ask them to pay. So they've they've like seen the show, they've liked the show. It's a great idea, right? But if you ever wished that more music had made it into the final film, then this provides a nice little treat. Almost every song featured in the theatrical film is played here in its entirety. I really enjoyed seeing all of this lost band footage. Unfortunately, this is usually when the quality of the bootleg starts to plummet even further making it really difficult to see what's going on. The songs aren't in the final stages of mixing, either. There are subtle differences with the finished songs in these rough versions here. How about deleted scenes? Well, there's just too much to cover, but some of the highlights for me include the origins of Billy Crystal's mind catering service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My father, my father st sort of started this thing, you know, because at home with food and the way my father was, it was weird. He used to say the same thing to me. Every dinner he'd say the same thing to me. Shut up and eat. So that's, that's what we do. I see. That's so the name of the company. Words of wisdom. Artie Fufkin convincing the band to do a radio interview at 6 a.m. Do I got to take my whole family and chain them to a radio station to get a record played? You got to understand, do I have to take a thing with an egg and smash a thing in my face to get a record played on the air today? You got to know what a, how important this is. This is important to a man. Derek showing Marty his most recent acting gig. I see, see, that's why he, he kills me. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. that's a, uh, yeah, we oh, thought okay. you were yeah. you were shooting him. Yeah, it, they turned it around on oh, you. That, what happens now? Well, <laughs> then there's the opening credits and then the movie begins. Oh, that was all before credits? Oh yeah, it's about the guy that comes in and shoots me. Tommy the limo driver really shows how much he loves Frank Sinatra. Oh, the Origins of Derek's notorious zucchini piece. It's made it believable. Well, some incredibility is part of what we're going after. Outside of that, the film is mostly an extension of what is already seen in the theatrical version. For example, the scene where they're lost trying to find their way to the stage, it's a much longer scene that has many more beats and moments. I'll keep saying hello, and maybe they'll find us. Oh, 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 oh. I hope they will. Hello, 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 hello. Same thing with Nigel's catering complaints. White, 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 right. white, fine, yeah. great. Yeah. I, my, I specifically said, I don't want whole biscuits. And then look, underneath, whoop, flip it up, look, look, lurking under here is little, uh, is little circular neg knob going, I hate that. There's a tendency to directly address the technical difficulties where the band is complaining to Ian. Either the pod got uh, damaged in transit, or the uh, the workmanship is simply shoddy. I, I really can't tell. Uh, it's as simple as that. Look, it's shoddy no, it, workmanship. It's no fucking effect if two of them open and one of them doesn't. The band is a little more aware of themselves here, and they dump a lot of the blame on Ian, which kind of makes his quitting the band carry a lot more baggage. There's also just a lot of little extra lines that don't really take the joke anywhere else. They just kind of repeat what's already been said. Ian, I was asked. I've got to have the whole the whole band play around. It's Ian, I was asked to make this piece. I wasn't asked to make a piece sh at 18 feet but high. I haven't you heard of 18 feet before to death. Don't I mean be ridiculous. Or we just see things that aren't particularly necessary. Reiner makes the decision to actually check in on Nigel after he quits the band. It kind of makes his return at the end a little less effective because he admits to missing David and playing on stage with the group in this small little interview. 
It ruins the surprise when he shows up standing in the doorway at the final show, and there's less tension when they finally confront each other. It really makes you realize what a masterpiece of editing Spinal Tap is. It boils scenes down to their essential core, gets you out of the scene as soon as the biggest laugh strikes. While the work print version features many, many funny moments, they're lost in a colossal amount of footage that isn't as interesting or just doesn't pack as much punch. It's not bad, it's just not as good. The finished film could easily have been a comfortable two-hour feature. Reiner didn't want to be precious with his footage. He cut it down to a short and sweet 82 minutes, and that made for a stronger standalone experience, I feel. The finished film is so brisk, the timing's so impeccable, every line hits, every joke lands, it cuts away just at the right moment. Editing really elevated it to the masterpiece that we know today. If the universe is indeed infinite, then how, what does that mean? How far is, is all the way? And then if it stops, what's stopping it? And what's behind what's stopping it? So what's the end, you know, is my mm -hmm. question to well, you. Yeah. The work print may be a big time investment to commit to, but I think it's a really fascinating look for fans of the film. As far as finding a copy, all I'll say is, you have to get creative. But for people wanting the full experience of the complete Road Chronicles, it's really worth seeking out. For more casual fans, I offer the alternative of just seeing some of the highlights. The first, a rare, out of print, Criterion Collection edition of the film, which features one hour deleted scenes, the original 20 minute demo, and two commentary tracks, one by Reiner and crew, and one by the cast. The deleted scenes are presented exactly as they appear in the work print version. It even features a time code at the bottom, indicating it likely came from a different source than the one I acquired. The Criterion disc also features some interview snippets that aren't in the work print either. You know, I wouldn't playing. think you could get too much variation. Uh, well, with it's an not album that's all bass. Yeah. Well, it's not about variation. Now, if you Google search the price of this disc, you might be saying, FUCK THAT SHIT! That's why I really only recommend this disc for the more serious fans who really have a great interest in pulling back the curtain and how the film was made, as it's the only release that treats the film as a fictional entity, where the actors are out of character. The currently in-print DVD and Blu-ray of the film, released by MGM, I think is a more entertaining alternative. These releases have over an hour of deleted scenes, which differ slightly from what's on the Criterion disc. The scenes are edited way down, in such a way that reflects the style of the finished film. Lots of interview footage is interspersed with highlights from the vast amount of deleted scenes. It actually feels more like a companion film watching it. Yeah, I'm getting so used to it, it's like looking at a friend. Big black eye there. I found this to be the most enjoyable way of seeing all the subplots, as it takes the discipline of boiling down jokes to their strongest core. It also really helps that the scenes are much higher in quality than the bootleg release. This disc is in keeping with the mythology of the band, as if it were a reality. Little featurettes on the disc check in with Marty DeBerge today, show some additional vintage tap material, building into the mythology of the band. Perhaps the most committed and hilarious is the full-length feature audio commentary done by guest McKean and Shearer in character as Spinal Tap. Give it a listen, it's one of the best commentary tracks I've ever heard. The really insightful out-of-character commentaries on the Criterion disc may not be present, but for the more casual fans or people just new to the film, the MGM release is absolutely the way to go. So the lesson here. Bigger doesn't always equal better. The original theatrical film will always stand as a groundbreaking masterpiece and one of the defining American comedies of all time. Seeing the additional character development is a real treat, but I think it's achieved such a status because it really is the best of the best footage from the 10 hours of stuff they shot. You can decide how much of that additional footage you want to track down, but hopefully this video has informed you enough to make a decision on which experience you think would be best for your taste. Either way, May Spinal Tap continue to melt brains and burst eardrums as they stand amongst the top ranks of pop culture icons. Thank you for watching Rough Cuts, and remember, you choose the final cut. One. Saucy Jack, you're a haughty one. Saucy Jack, when the street lamps gaslight flickers and fails, then you see the last light glinting off the entrails. Oh, naughty, 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 you're a sneaky.
cheeky one. A saucy jack, you're a cheeky one. Saucy jack, first the horse says, go now, fancy a squeeze. Next you will be shoved down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs>